I am not going to be telling you everything you need to know. Instead, I'm going to be showing you how to get. Instead, I'm going to be showing you how to get started trying out Kubernetes um, on CentOS. Um, for anybody who's actually interested in following along with the demos here, you might actually want to move forward. Um, I have blown up the text, uh, but there will be lots of terminal work here. So, um, what I'm going to be showing you here is just how to quickly and easily set up a test cluster um, that you can try out stuff on Kubernetes with. Um, now, one of the questions I get um, at any you know send us event, Red Hat, or what is what about OpenShift? Um, and one of the things about uh, OpenShift, even OpenShift Origin, is that the only installers that are available for it are installers for um, a production enterprise system, which is great when you actually want to install a production enterprise system. But when you want to just test this out to see whether or not moving to container orchestration, et cetera, might be useful to you. Um, it's a lot of trouble to actually get a system set up. Um, you can use OpenShift IO instead um, as, as your way to get online, and just with Kubernetes, you can use GKE, et cetera, but a lot of us need to try out doing stuff on bare metal. Um, so, let's go ahead and get that set up. Um, the, um, oh, by the way, for any of you who actually want to follow along with this but are having trouble seeing the screen up here, this is the jburkus slash centos kubernetes repo on GitHub. Um, you can go ahead and just clone that. Um, we are going to be deploying a cluster on this little five set of nodes on AWS. Um, uh, so that we actually have separate machines uh, rather than doing it on VMs, which is really honestly not the same. Um, the idea is to actually have something that you could use. So, uh, we're going to start out. Now, the most common way to run Kubernetes is on top of Docker. That is, Kubernetes controls the cluster, Docker actually runs the containers on the individual machines. You don't have to use Docker for this. Um, there's also Cryo. Um, there's a couple of other options um, in those terms. However, Docker is still the mainstream option, and most of the documentation um, and tools that you're going to find are going to be for Docker. Uh, so I would say if you're doing this right now, um, go ahead and install Docker because you'll have to solve fewer of your own individual problems that way. Okay, you know what? This. Hold on. Let's bring the bottom of that up. this all set up and then it resized when it disconnected from the projector and reconnected. So let me, there we go. Okay, uh, now the other fun reason that we're doing this, that we're installing Docker first, is because um, for a quick install of Kubernetes, and actually for most installs of Kubernetes, not only is Kubernetes going to be controlling Docker, but it'll also be running on Docker at the same time. We're running all the Kubernetes components and containers, which makes it much easier to install that. Um, so if you are looking at old instructions that have you installing all of the Kubernetes components from RPMs, um, those are going to be old instructions. You'll discover it's hard to find RPMs for the latest versions of Kubernetes. And that's because we've mostly gone over to a containerized install. Uh, and where you get that containerized install 
um, is uh, we have a uh, CentOS repo um, that has uh, the kubeadmin components, which is what I'm going to show you um, for this, and some other Kubernetes stuff. Um, and so just add that repo. to your Yum repos list. Um, and then you can install the Kube ADM binaries. Now, what Kube ADM is, is it's one of several tools um, for, managing, for managing installation and upgrade of a Kubernetes cluster. That is the actual binaries that run Kubernetes itself. Um, uh, there are others. Um, I'll talk about those uh, after we're done with the demos. Um, Kubeadmin, though, is the fastest and simplest, um, which is why I'm showing it to you now. Um, the um, and uh, has some other advantages. Now, um, one of the things um, that you will see in the instructions that you see on Kubernetes.io. Um, and elsewhere is, they will tell you to disable SE Linux. No. Um, the, um, um, there, um, it's true that if you do an install without making any changes, you will run into SE Linux violations that prevent Kubernetes from running properly. Um, however, there are some simple fixes um, for SE Linux, which are actually documented on the Kubernetes wiki, um, of needing to set some permissions. Um, and this actually involved Dan Walsh's team, who worked a lot on SE Linux, went ahead and added specific permissions for Docker containers so that we could operate these kinds of systems properly. Um, but you do need to actually go ahead and set SE Linux tags on a bunch of directories after installing the Kubernetes binary, because before you install them, some of these directories don't exist. Um, the, again, these instructions in the Kubernetes wiki, um, I've turned them into a bash script if you download it from that repository. It's not actually all that complicated. You're just setting permissions on four different directories. Uh, the other thing, actually, if you're doing this on AWS in particular, um, for some reason, when I deploy CentOS instance on AWS, sometimes they have IP tables disabled. And sometimes they don't. And I've never figured this out. And I filed some bugs about it. No one else can figure it out. Um, but you just need to make sure that IP tables is actually running. Um, and so I added that to the script. Um, the, um, so now we've got all our sort of prerequisites set up. And we have kubeadmin installed. So now I'm actually going to do a reset because the kubeadmin RPM actually ends up creating a bunch of things that aren't necessarily the cluster that we want. Um, so what Kubernetes Reset does is it wipes out your existing cluster. You obviously don't want to do this if you were using the cluster for something. Um, but if you were doing a bunch of testing and you want to start over, this is the command that you use to clean things up. Um, so. There is one binary. Um, so you basically got two sets of binaries here. Um, one binary is kubeadmin, which is just an installation and upgrade tool. The second binary is something called the kubelet. And the kubelet needs to be installed on every cluster. That is the daemon that controls the rest of Kubernetes, or that is the sort of interface between system D and the rest of Kubernetes. Um, everything else is going to be running in a container. So we've got the kubelet started up, and now it is time for us to start up, um, to actually start the Kubernetes cluster by installing the master components on this node. Now, I'm adding an extra switch here that has to do with networking. 
and I will explain in a minute why this is there, because it has to do with something else. But the main command here that you're getting here is kubeadmin init. Um, and init basically creates a new cluster on the node that is going to be the master for that cluster. And it actually has to do a whole bunch of work, um, including, and now it's bringing up a control pane and pulling it and make sure that it can spin up a container locally. Um, let me take just a second here. The, um, so, uh, this, in this case, what we're deploying here is a single master cluster. Um, it's obviously not a production setup, but a fine setup for testing. And so the single master has several components on it um, known as the control plane. Um, and this includes, in Kubernetes term, the API server, which is the address that you um, tag for everything, the, the address that you write instructions to. Everything goes to, through the API, through the API server. The controller, which is what actually dispatches containers and everything else, um, etcd, which is our <coughs> shared data repository, um, and controller manager, I don't know, something else. There's a couple of other things. I'll show you in a minute. The, um, so now, one of the other things that I actually need here that got installed with the Kubernetes, Kubernetes packages is one more binary, which is an interface tool called uh, kubectl or kubectl or kubectl, um, depending on who you ask. Um, so, however, initially we're not going to be actually um, able to connect to our locally created server because when you install Kubernetes, you're doing kubeadmin, it uses um, uh, certificate authentication by default. Um, which is really what you actually want to be using because you, because we're talking about container cluster, you might be on a public cloud where the uh, network is untrusted and so you want everything to be encrypted including authentication. But the problem with that is that means that for your client to connect, you actually need to get copies of the authentication certificates. Um, now, created a little script for that and just so this is not do magic. Um, all it's doing here is we generate the certificates are available on the master, um, and I am just copying them into a local config directory so I can go ahead and connect. And now I can go ahead and look at, I've got a single node, which is the master right here. Now, Kubernetes is basically a collection of APIs, and all components in Kubernetes are swappable. Now, a bunch of the components actually have default things um, that got installed for you, like people installing an alternate controller is an advanced technique. However, there is no default virtual container network. In order for um, applications deployed on Kubernetes in containers that are going to go in different servers to communicate with each other, they need their own network overlay or other kind of virtual network. Um, and there is no default one, meaning that when you install this, you actually immediately get pushed into choosing one. Um, now, the one that we are going to be installing, and I'm actually going to copy and paste this because otherwise it's hard to type, um, is Flannel, uh, which is a fine network overlay for test cases. Um, for production, you might end up wanting to use something like Calico or Weave or one of the other networks, but those often involve extra configuration steps, which again, we're trying to be quick and easy just so we can test things out. And so that was where that extra switch in init came from. That pod network switch in init is required for me to install Flint. Now, again, this is a fun bit of sort of bootstrap levitation because these network components are actually being installed as containers running on Docker, and then they control the network for Docker. Um, which is both a fun bit of bootstrap levitation and also a potential source of problems. Um, so, okay, great, we have a master, but we can't actually deploy anything because we don't have any nodes that accept application containers to deploy them to. So we actually need a worker. I've got these other machines. Now, I don't actually want to um, 
I don't actually want to go through those manual installation steps again. So let's go ahead and just run an Ansible script against the first worker um, so that you know that that is not just do magic. If you look in the repo, um, we've actually got all the things we're doing. All we're doing is running the same scripts that we ran on the master. Um, And it will install all of those things. So we're going through um, installing Docker and Kubernetes, Kubeadmin, activating Docker, fixing the SE Linux, uh, resetting Kubernetes, and starting with Kubelet. So will we have a minute here? Um, let's talk a little bit about why I'm, you know, using because one of the the one of the con bits of confusion you run into when you try out Kubernetes for the first time is that there's a whole bunch of installation tools, and all of them are a little bit confusing. Um, I'm recommending Kubeadmin for a first try simply because it is the simplest and easiest for setting up a test cluster. It covers both cloud and bare metal cases, which not all tools do. Um, the, um, it's under constant and rapid development, so they keep adding things to it. It has support for upgrading the resulting cluster um, to new version, and by upgrading I mean new version of Kubernetes. Um, it's also compatible with uh, CentOS Atomic and the eventual CentOS CoreOS. Um, so you can use it on that, which again, you can't necessarily use some of the other things. Um, and it's a good way to install the newest versions um, and possibly even beta versions of um, Kubernetes. Let's see how we're doing on the installation there. There we go. We installed all of the components, but we actually need to make that node part of our cluster. So in order to make the node part of the cluster, we need to actually do some manual passing of the token because Kubernetes does not assume that we are operating on a trusted network. And so as a result, we actually have to give it keys for the discovery tokens it's supposed to use. So let's create So the kubeadmin token commands are actually for manipulating these tokens. Um, so uh, by default, these tokens have a 24-hour lifespan. Um, you can change that. Um, you can give them a much shorter lifespan if you really don't trust your network. Um, the, um, and then uh, on this worker, uh, we run that join command. Oh, and that went by really fast. So. Um, it's always nice when it does that. So what you're doing is you're telling it which machine to connect to and which port. You are giving it a discovery token and you're giving it a uh, certificate authority hash um, in order to connect. Um, and you need to give it all of those things and that way we can actually have um, a secure joining of the cluster whether or not we trust the network. Um, so. And there we've got one master and one worker node. Um, so uh, now I actually had said five node cluster in the description here. So um, let's go ahead and start up an Ansible playbook to set up the rest of the cluster. And again, this is a relatively simple playbook um, in the repository. We are just running through the setup commands that we had for the other things. Um, and then actually running that join command um, on the other machines, uh, which will take a minute. So while we're actually going through that, let's talk a little bit about, there actually are alternatives to Kubeadmin, um, partly because um, there are some limitations, which is 
the Kubernetes team has been working on development of this, and they started out with, let's start out with the simplest case of single master test cluster, and then gradually make the other things easier to do. So when you actually get to setting up storage for Kubernetes, that is persistent volumes, um, if you're running the public cloud, cloud provider support, um, so that you have integration with your cloud provider, um, or setting up a high availability master, things get more complicated in a hurry because you're basically using sort of base level Kubernetes reconfiguration. You can't do all of these things, but Kubernetes doesn't actually give you nice, easy tools to do it. That will change eventually, um, but they've been working a little on a t at a time. Um, that does mean that you might actually check out some other tools. Um, one of them is Kubespray. So people have used Ansible for a long time to install Kubernetes. Um, the current most complete and up-to-date set of Ansible scripts is something called Kubespray. Uh, there's this thing out there called Kubernetes Ansible. Don't use it. Development on that halted a year ago, more than a year ago, and it is not in any way up to date. Um, also, a bunch of folks at this company called Heptio wrapped um, Kubeadmin in a Go-based UI to create something called Kubicorn um, that makes it somewhat easier to install via Kubeadmin on specific public clouds. Um, I think just AWS and, um, uh, what's the thing with the droplets? Anyway, um, the... Um, DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean, thank you. Um, the, um, so, but again, that's, that's sort of making rapid progress. Um, so there are some alternatives if you're actually looking at setting up a more production cluster and you find the jump from Kubernetes to uh, mainly configuring the production cluster a little bit too much. So let's see how we're doing here. And there we are. Um, that could have been. So we've got all of our nodes. Um, all of our nodes are running. Um, so let's deploy something. <clears throat> So we've got, we're starting up a bunch of in default uh, NGI next pods. Um, let's actually make it possible to connect to these. Because I haven't set up load balancing or external DNS or anything, um, I'm just going to expose them under a port. <coughs> Looks like our port is 35, 31577. Uh, the, uh, so let's actually go over there. Oh, I need a public IP address, don't I? So the way the node port works is that you can connect to any node any of the worker nodes and it will redirect and so there we've got the nginx parking page um, uh, showing that it's actually up and running so that is our quick five node cluster um, as you can see you can do it really quickly and easily um, in order to test out whether or not kubernetes would work for something that you're thinking of um, and then move on to all the production cluster headaches when you are actually ready to look at deploying in production um, so, now, and we are up and running, um, and since I started late, I can take five minutes for questions? Sure. Okay. So, five minutes for questions, if anybody has any. I'll just say well done. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you.
Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And feel free to download the scripts. Again, Jay Brookes Centos Kubernetes. Um, hope you get started a little bit if you try it out. Um, also, uh, Jason Brooks um, has a good page on installing uh, uh, using Kubeadmin. Um, this is targeted at CentOS and on the coast, but it'll actually work for regular CentOS as well. So thanks a lot.